Recording in progress. That's new. Okay, I don't, I don't know where that sound came from. <laughs> Oh, change stuff. Okay. All right, that, that seems a little bit better. Get too much feedback. Um, it seems cold in here. Does it seem like yeah? What's with that? Like cold outside, I guess. Um. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, my highlight was my refrigerator breaking. Woke up, the ice melted all over my kitchen and got to clean everything out. It was so much fun. Uh, so I hope you had a little better Saturday morning than I did. Uh, last week, we almost got through metabolism. Uh, just a couple other things that I want to comment on. Um, I don't want to skip these next couple slides because it ties into what you're going to be doing in lab uh, next week. So uh, I don't want to skip over that. Then we'll we'll start genetics. Um, but as we finished last time, we talked uh, we finished talking about anaerobic respiration and fermentation. Um, those are two processes that are often students mix them up or kind of think about them as being the same thing, uh, which I want to try to dispel that. They are the same in that neither require oxygen, but remember anaerobic fermentation, or sorry, <laughs> anaerobic respiration requires uh, a glycolytic pathway, some kind of Krebs cycle, and then an electron transport system. Okay, fermentation is just like, Analysis, and then maybe only a few other reactions where you've got some kind of organic electron acceptor. Yeah. And the main purpose of that is in the NADH is that ATP, right? It's only to convert NADH back to NADH. Good. Yes. So usually in a fermentative pathway, oftentimes the cell's not getting any additional ATP, they're only getting the ATP from glycolysis. So it's important to keep glycolysis running by recycling those NADHs back to NAD so that uh, the oxidation of glycolysis can happen. So yes, good. Um, and as I was reading ahead in the lab book for lab eight, which is your Wednesday, Thursday lab, if you're in lab, um, I noticed we did a bunch of changes to the lab book and the way they, the way they, um, define oxidative phosphorylation in the lab book, I don't like because they define it as, oh, when oxygen's final electron acceptor in an electron transport chain, we call that oxidative phosphorylation. And that is not the way I defined it. We, we said, you know, any ADP that's phosphorylated to ATP when NADH is oxidated back to NAD, that's oxidative phosphorylation. So that can happen no matter what the final electron acceptor is, whether it's oxygen, whether it's nitrate, whether it's sulfate, some inorganic ion. So um, I don't know, I have to ask a few people about that, but um, that might be confusing, again, if you're reading Wednesday, Thursday lab ahead of time. Um, Okay, so I, I just want to finish up here thinking about what if it's not the cell is not using glucose. Okay, usually the cell will always choose to use glucose as its kind of first choice uh, in terms of getting energy or, or carbon. But if glucose isn't available, then most cells don't just die. Usually they're a little flexible and they can use some other kind of macromolecule like a protein or a lipid especially to get energy from. So 
a quick look at how that might happen. Um, remember our, our bacteria cells, they, they not only have a cytoplasmic membrane, right? But they also have almost always a nice thick cell wall. All right, so if the cell is going to catabolize a protein, proteins are pretty large and maybe they have a special channel to bring that protein into the cell. If not, uh, they can't phagocytize it, right? Because they've got this rigid cell wall. So they don't have any choice except to secrete some kind of enzyme outside of the cell. Okay, in, in our lab next week, we call these exoenzymes or extracellular enzymes, right? Some enzyme that's gonna chew up that macromolecule into shorter bits, all right? So say it's some protease, you're gonna test for a couple of proteases in lab. Um, remember, if you have a, a polypeptide or protein and that gets chopped up, remember what that's made of amino acids, all right? So it's chopped up, a protease will, will hydrolyze that into shorter chains of amino acids that now are small enough that can be brought into the cell. And typically what happens first in, in protein metabolism is there's some kind of deamination. And that just means that the amino group is removed from that amino acid. So like right here, or right here, or right here. Uh, in lab next week, you're going to test for an enzyme called phenylalanine deaminase. That's an enzyme that if cells have it, they can use phenylalanine as a nutrition source. It just cleaves that amino group off of, of phenylalanine. Okay, so then what you're left with is some two-carbon compound here. Remember last time we said the Krebs cycle only accepts two-carbon compounds right that can get shuttled right into the krebs cycle uh, attaches to oxalacetic acid and forms that first substrate in the krebs cycle citric acid okay and then of course we get lots of um, nadhs off of that a little atp by substrate level of phosphorylation um, what happens to this nh2 uh, that is usually converted to nh3 in the cell which we know as ammonia. Uh, what do you know about ammonia or ammonium? Ammonia. Uh, what's the pH likely going to be? It's alkaline, right? Yeah, really high pH. So um, alkaline. Okay. So when when sugars were used say in, in fermentation, we talked about how you get really acidic end products like lactic acid. Even if a cell respires aerobically, the end products are, are slightly acidic, uh, but it may be doing fermentation at the same time and you get really acidic end products. But if a protein's metabolized, you're not gonna get acids. You're gonna get really alkaline end products. So um, that can be important if you're trying to understand what exactly the cell is using to metabolize. Okay. Um, what if lipids are used for, for an energy source? Uh, once again, big, big molecule. Uh, the cell will usually secrete some kind of extracellular enzyme. We'll call it lipase, uh, which will split those lipids up into three carbon glycerol and fatty acids. Okay. So so right, right here at the top here, this is a lipid molecule. A lipase would, would cleave it right here. Uh, what happens to that three carbon glycerol? Um, well, a little bit of ATP has to be inputted uh, to convert that three carbon glycerol here to DHAP. Now, I made note of that kind of briefly when we talk through glycolysis, that's dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And that's one of the molecules, if you remember when I said, uh, the one intermediate is not symmetric. So when it splits, you don't get two of the same thing. You actually get a dihydroxyacetone phosphate uh, and a glyceraldehyde three phosphate. But usually that DHAP is converted right into glyceraldehyde three phosphate. Well, here, uh, if a lipid is metabolized, you uh, can easily get that DHAP that just funnels right into 
right after that splitting step of the Emden-Meyerhoff harness glycolysis. All right, so then we get some ATP out of that. Um, it goes into the Krebs cycle, get lots more energy from just that three carbon glycerol. Um, then what happens to the fatty acids? Well, those undergo a process called beta oxidation. Uh, and that's a step-by-step -step process where the, the beta carbon is gonna be the next to the last one, the second one from the end. Uh, so we get the cleaving off of the last two carbons uh, kind of in a step-by-step -step way, okay? So lots and lots of two carbon compounds. Um, and in that process of just cleaving off those two carbons, you can see we get um, some electrons coming off there just to make one acetyl-CoA uh, in that process of attaching that acetyl coenzyme to um, those two carbon compounds. And you recognize that as being uh, what shuttles into the Krebs cycle. So not only do we get electrons from the beta oxidation itself, but then we got all these lots and lots and lots of acetyl CoA's that go into the Krebs cycle. So lots and lots of energy from metabolism of lipids. All right. All right. So any other questions about metabolism? Hopefully, uh, within few days here, you'll get that homework started. Some of you already have. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Uh, this genetics, your book splits it up into two chapters because um, it's quite a lot of material. Um, I'm hoping that we'll get through most of it this week. Uh, your ne next exam is next Wednesday. And I was hoping to include all of this genetic stuff on that exam. Uh, we have to adjust that a little bit. We will. I don't really want to bleed too much into Wednesday uh, with new lecture stuff, but hopefully that's the goal at least to get through most of it this week and we'll see where we're at. Um, but yeah, next Wednesday. So just kind of keep that in your mind. Um, chapter 10 is, is actually pretty short. And I know that at least it's probably in yours too, um, it's numbered there's like two sections, 2.10, I think, when, when I look at that. And uh, that was a mistake somebody else made and I haven't been able to figure out how to go in and change that. <laughs> um, but uh, regardless, uh, we're just gonna be looking here at first a little biochemistry of the genome. Uh, there's a few, there's several different, several uh, important experiments that I think are important to look at uh, just so we kind of, it's always good to look at those famous experiments to kind of understand how it was designed and you know how how the controls were set up and everything to understand that. So uh, we're gonna look at a couple of famous experiments and then just kind of hopefully the structure of DNA and RNA is review, uh, but it's important review. Uh, and we'll look a little bit uh, differences between uh, prokaryotic genomes and eukaryotic genomes. Um, as we move forward here in the genetics, um, I am always going to be talking primarily about bacterial genetics. Uh, at, from time to time, I'll say, oh, but look, here's how it's different in eukaryotes. Um, always assume that if I don't say any different that I'm talking about bacteria. Uh, for a lot of what we're gonna talk about, it's the same. <laughs> so there, I like the quote in your textbook uh, by Jacques Monod. He said, what's true for E. coli is true for the elephant. <laughs> so, um, you know, when we study things, it's a lot more easier to study them in bacteria and a lot of things, uh, genetics anyway, is, is true for um, larger animals as well. Okay, so uh, I wanna start, jump in here with, with a little bit of history. Um, and it seems like kind of, maybe an odd place to start, but your book does a lot of history and talking about how we came to understand that DNA is the unit of heredity, um, because we didn't always understand that. Um, for a long time, we thought it was probably a, some kind of protein because there's you know 20 some amino acids that make up proteins and there's a lot of, you know, there can be a lot of variability when you have that many amino acids to work with. 
there's only four nucleotides. So it seems like there wouldn't be as much variation that we could write into that code, but uh, turns out that, that that's, that's what it is. Um, but I wanna talk about uh, this experiment by Frederick Griffith. Uh, and it says that in the caption there, but sometimes it's kind of hard, hard to find. Um, and this was done in 1928. Um, so you think about what we knew in 1928. We didn't know the structure of DNA. We knew there was some unit of heredity, uh, but you know we just didn't we didn't know a lot about that. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I don't know how he even thought to do these experiments, uh, but it demonstrated uh, the process of transformation. And we're gonna go a little bit more detail into that process later, um, not very much more, uh, but that's a kind of, uh, that's a way that bacteria or, or the cells can share their DNA with other cells. Okay, so again, he didn't know, I don't think he called it DNA per se. Uh, he didn't know it was that, but he knew that there was some heritable element that was being shared among cells. Uh, and he proved that. Uh, and he used uh, a couple of strains of strep pneumonia. And this is an organism that you're gonna get a chance to grow up if you're in lab. So we talk a lot about streptococcus actually in lab and later on uh, in lecture here. There was two different strains. There was a strain he referred to as S, which was the wild type strain. And that just means that was kind of the normal non-mutated version. Um, and they have a, a great big capsule. Okay, remember capsule uh, protects the cell in several different ways. Um, primarily interested here, it, it protects um, the bacteria from being phagocytized. It's not easily phagocytized by, in this case, the mouse's uh, innate immune cells. Uh, and there was another strain called the rough strain. Uh, this was the mutant strain where it was not able to produce a capsule. Okay, so what you need to know when he injected mice with that wild type uh, encapsulated strain, the mice usually died. Okay, they got this really nasty pneumonia and they died. Uh, but if he injected the mice with the rough strain, um, then, then the mice lived. Like that didn't, uh, basically the bacteria couldn't establish an infection. The mouse's immune system took care of it and, and the mouse lived because it didn't make a capsule. Uh, so that's what you need to know to start out with. And then he, like I said, I don't know how he thought to do these things, but he used a heat killed smooth strain. So he injected the mice with, the um, the wild type, if it was alive, it would have killed the mice. But again, he killed the bacteria and then injected it. And like you would expect, the mice lived. Um, and he also injected the mice with some different mice with the rough strain, which again didn't didn't kill the mice, as well as the heat killed smooth strain. So separately, either one of those organisms didn't kill the mice, but when he injected them together, the mice died. So, and, and when he took uh, organisms that he isolated from that dead mouse and injected them into another mouse, that mouse died. Uh, and when he grew them up in culture, he found that they were uh, the wild type. So what happened here, some of the um, DNA from the dead smooth cells, when, when a cell dies, the cell wall, the cell membranes start to break apart. Some of that DNA kind of leaked out and the, the live um, cells that couldn't make a capsule was able to take up the DNA uh, and actually then have the instructions to make a capsule. So, uh, the mutant ones became back into the wild type. Okay, so that, that's what transformation is. Um, DNA from a dead cell uh, being passed into uh, a live cell. But 
at that time, again, he didn't call it DNA. Um, there in a follow-up experiments, and this was in 1944, I believe. Yeah. Um, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty. Okay, Avery, McLeod, and McCarty. They did a follow-up experiment to try to understand what that heritable principle was in Griffith's experiments. So they took the same organism, um, strep pneumoniae, uh, and they removed the capsular components. I'm not sure how they did that. Um, and so basically they had the protein, the DNA, and the RNA from the cells kind of all mixed up together there. I don't know if they homogenized it or what exactly they did. So then they try to figure out, well, which, which is it? Is it the protein, is it the DNA, or is it the RNA that's actually a heritable um, uh, particle there? So as a control, they just in injected all those, those proteins and DNA and RNA into the rough cells. Um, and they found that, um, that those cells took up that heritable, heritable element and, and made smooth cells. Okay, so that was their control. Okay, it's one of those things. Um, and then they went through a series of steps. They added proteases to get rid of the protein. Uh, still, they had uh, a cell, so it must not be the protein. They added ribonucleases to degrade the RNA. Oh, they still got transformation, so that it must not be the RNA. Um, when they added deoxyribonucleases to break down the DNA, then they did not get. Uh, transformation. So they concluded that the DNA is what's uh, important to, to transmit that information. All right, so if we look at the structure of DNA, and when I use the word structure, I think there might have been a little confusion about this on the last exam. I think you can use that word in a few different ways. Some, some people think about that as, oh, when you look at something, you see the structure. But when I'm talking about structure, I mean like the molecular, what it's made up of. So if you look at the structure of DNA, again, hopefully this is review. Uh, it's composed of a nitrogenous rich base. And we'll look at those bases in a minute, but lots of nitrogen in those, in those bases. Um, there's four different ones. Uh, the deoxyribose sugar, and that's a pentose sugar, meaning there's five carbons. And we like to label those those carbons. Um, we count them. So you start at the you start at the oxygen atom, and you count going away from the carbon that's not right on the ring, and you label that the the one prime, the two prime carbon, three prime, four prime, and then the five prime one is the one that's again not in that pentose ring. Um, and that's important as we think about the directionality. Uh, of, of DNA, um, deoxyribose sugar, and then uh, also a phosphate. Okay, so those are what, what make up a, a deoxyribonucleotide. Sometimes we just call that a nucleotide. Okay. Uh, and then the bases, again, you don't need to be able to spit back the structure here. Um, Cytosine and thymine are the pyrimidine bases. They have one ring. Adenine and guanine have two rings. They're considered purines. Um, and that I remember having trouble keeping that terminology in my mind. Um, so the mnemonic that I used um, that helped me, and so I'll pass it on to you. When I was in college, I was part. My major was part of the ag school, so call ourselves Aggies sometimes. So Aggies for adenine and guanine are two pure. Uh, adenine and guanine have two rings and they're the purines. So I don't know, that, that helped me remember the terminology. Um, of course, in, in RNA, we have a different base here instead of the thymine. Okay. Uh, each nucleotide is going to be bonded to the next nucleotide on, on one strand of DNA uh, through, through a phosphate and uh, what's called a phosphodiester bond. 
Okay, that's a kind of covalent bond. Uh, what do you know about covalent bonds? Okay, there's, th yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, yes, they're shared, shared electrons. So uh, that's uh, supposed to be the strongest bond because there's, as it said in one source, um, there's no conflict to weaken the arrangement, okay? They equally share those electrons. Uh, so very strong bonds that make up um, the, whatever, the sides of the ladder, how the strand of, of DNA. Okay, and, and notice, um, this is written a couple different places, but the directionality here, we always say this is the five prime end of the strand because there's that uh, five prime carbon sticking up and down here, it's the three prime hydroxyl group. Okay, so that's five prime to three prime. That's the directionality. Uh, and of course, it's Watson and Crick that came up with the, uh, we give them credit for discovering that DNA is arranged in a double helix. Uh, that very famous paper they wrote in 1953 was only one page long, and they didn't do any of the experiments. They just took what other people had figured out and kind of synthesized it in a new way and came up with that double helix. Uh, it's got a major groove and a minor groove that can kind of play a part into what enzymes can, can bind here or there. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the base pairing rules um, adenine always binds to thymine and guanine always binds to cytosine. That's uh, sh Shagriff, sh sh Shagriff, I'm not sure how you say that, uh, figures rules of complementary base pairing. Um, so there's a homework question that, that asks you something about this. If you know, say, the relative percentage of one base, say adenine, you can work out the relative percentage of all the other ones, because if you know how much adenine there is, then there's exactly the same amount of thymines, and then, you know, whatever's left over, you, you split it in two, okay? So that's for uh, any DNA that's double-stranded. Again, given one, you can work out the other one. So uh, there's a homework question about that. Um, when the adenines are, are bound to the thymines, we get uh, two hydrogen bonds. And when cytosines are bound to guanines, we get three hydrogen bonds. Uh, and that's, that's important because in spots where the DNA is, is newly kind of unzipped, it's usually in, in AT rich areas because again, there's only two hydrogen bonds there. They're easily pulled apart. Um, and note that DNA, we call it anti-parallel, meaning um, one strand is, you know, going in one direction. So if this is the three prime end of this, this strand, then this is going to be the five prime end of its complementary strand. Okay. Make sure I didn't forget to say anything there. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk much more about DNA. Let's let's talk about the structure of RNA and how it's different. Uh, of course, it's very similar. It has a different sugar. It has ribose instead of deoxyribose. Okay, so the only difference there is is right here where ribose has a hydroxyl group and deoxyribose. Deoxy is without that oxygen there. It just has hydrogen. So. They're very similar. Uh, that one little change makes ribose a little bit less stable. So it's ideal for being used in applications where it's just kind of temporary, right? DNA, that's the blueprint. We want it to be very stable and last a really long time and not have any mistakes in it. Uh, but the RNA, again, it's just, we'll talk about different kinds of RNA, but they're more temporary purposes. Uh, and of course, then there's a different base, uracil instead of thymine. Very similar. There's only difference right here where the thymine has a methyl group and the uracil doesn't. So they're, they're very similar. Uh, RNA, 
of course, uh, where DNA is double stranded, RNA is single stranded. Now, the exception there, we do see single stranded DNA in viruses, and we do see double stranded RNA in viruses. So when we discovered those two things, that was kind of mind blowing, but um, again, we do see kind of forms and viruses that we don't see in any other kind of life. Uh, and because RNA is single stranded, it can kind of fold around on itself and make some more kind of three dimensional um, structures kind of bond with itself there in different ways. Uh, all right, so RNA has many roles in the cell. Uh, let's think about the types of RNA. Uh, probably the one that everybody forgets about, there are RNA primers uh, that are necessary when DNA copies itself. Okay. Um, so we'll say necessary in DNA replication. And we'll probably get to that today, starting uh, replication or, you know. Um, and of course, um, when RNA is made, uh, we say it's made by the process known as transcription. Okay, so it's made using DNA as a template. Uh, messenger RNA, that's kind of the one that we're always talking about because it's important in the flow of information in the cell. Um, but um, it's, it's really just an intermediary between the DNA uh, and the ribosome. It's going to carry information to the ribosome where it gets changed into proteins or translated into proteins. So, and actually only about 4% uh, of the total RNA in the cell is messenger RNA. And again, that's the one that everybody thinks of. Um, RNA primers are only about 10 to 20 base pairs. So very, very small amount of the total RNA in the cell. Um, tRNA and messenger RNA is very, very temporary. It degrades really quickly. So we don't actually get a lot of that. Um, tRNA may be like 10% of the RNA in the cell is tRNA, even though these are very short as well, only about 75 base pairs. Uh, their job is to deliver the correct amino acid to the ribosome. Okay, so the way we often see tRNAs drawn is like this. They're going to have an amino acid attached um, up at the top end there. Um, they are matching to uh, the messenger RNA codon. So, you know, three bases, whatever, we'll say it's GCC. Um, and then on the tRNA, there is an anticodon to match that sequence and the messenger RNA. So that would be CGG if it was matching that one that I just made up. Um, and we always picture it kind of flat with these hairpin loops. But in reality, we think that that's not the way it looks in the cell, that it's got more of a three dimensional structure. So it might actually look something more like that in the cell. Our old textbook always used that icon when it was referring to tRNAs. Okay, uh, let's see. But the kind of RNA that everybody always forgets about is ribosomal RNA. And actually about 85% of the RNA in the cell is ribosomal RNA. Um, what's special about this kind of RNA is that it can be catalytic. Okay, it, it can actually act as an enzyme um, and we call it ribozyme when it acts as an enzyme. Uh, and of course, ribosomal RNA is the dominant molecule in the ribosome. Um, so all these, these pieces here, like 
five S ribosomal RNA, twenty three S ribosomal RNA. There's there's just different lengths of ribosomal RNA that make up both the large subunit and the small subunit in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, and I always like to show this picture. I didn't post this because it looks a little scary, but just appreciate the complexity. Here's some, this is a structure of ribosomal RNA um, in a particular, uh, I think it's in a small subunit of a particular bacteria. Um, and it's associated, the purple part there is proteins. So it's associated with proteins and that's what makes up the ribosome. Okay, so just, again, appreciate the complexity. Uh, okay, so if we compare uh, the genomes of prokaryotes and eukaryotes, um, and we're going to lump archaea and bacteria together when we say prokaryotes, there's actually some differences uh, between the two, but uh, we'll lump them together just uh, for simplicity here. And we talked about this a little bit before. Uh, eukaryotic chromosomes, of course, um, they typically will have many. Uh, you and I, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in our cells, and prokaryotes are usually only going to have one, sometimes two, uh, but most often they're only going to have one chromosome, and it's circular, where, of course, uh, in eukaryotes, they're going to have linear chromosomes, uh, prokaryotes, they only have one copy, okay, haploid. You only have one chromosome, you only have one copy of that, that makes sense. Where eukaryotes are gonna be diploid. Like I said, we have 23 pairs. We have two of each chromosome. So we have a backup. Um, in eukaryotes, we have so much DNA in every cell. Um, in our cells, for example, each one of our cells has about two meters of DNA in it which, you know, a meter is this far, like that's a lot of DNA. So it's typically round bound in histone proteins. I don't know, if for storage purposes. And prokaryotes don't have as much DNA. Um, they still need to package it up a little bit. It's, a, it's they, they call them histone-like proteins. So, they're similar, but not quite the same. Uh, and of course, in prokaryotes, the, that chromosome is gonna be found uh, here in the nucleoid region uh, of the cytoplasm. No membrane around there. And of course, eukaryotes are gonna have their chromosomes in the nucleus of the cell, the membrane bound nucleus. Okay. Uh, in addition, prokaryotes will typically have um, the, these structures uh, called plasmids, uh, extra chromosomal uh, DNA. Again, this is this is prokaryotes only, as far as I know. Um, so smaller circular molecules of DNA, uh, they actually can replicate on a different timetable as the, the chromosome. Um, and what kind of genes do they carry? Usually ones that are not absolutely necessary for the survival of the cell. Okay, so they're not gonna carry instructions on how to make the enzymes of glycolysis. Okay, those are gonna be found somewhere on the chromosome. Uh, but they are gonna encode for for proteins that may give the cell some kind of survival advantage. So some examples, there are many more different kinds of plasmids. plasmids. Some examples, um, a fertility plasmid. And we uh, abbreviate those and call them F plasmids. Um, they carry instructions uh, for conjugation. So in other words, they enable the cell uh, to make a, a, a pelus, okay? We talked about that structure. They're kind of the same structure as fimbriae. Uh, they can reach out to another cell and pull those two cells closer. 
um, so that they can actually share a plasmid. Um, we're going to talk more about conjugation, uh, probably at the end of the week or early next week. Um, resistance plasmids. We often abbreviate those R plasmids. Um, they carry instructions to help a cell be able to live in the presence of antibiotics. Okay, so if a cell has a fertility plasmid, it enables them to share DNA easily. What would they share? Well, they could share any resistance plasmids they have. So uh, that's kind of a bad combination. Then you've got a cell that's sharing its resistance everywhere. Uh, and another example, uh, a virulence plasmid. Uh, and that just means that a, a cell has maybe some mechanism to, uh, when, it, when a cell is virulent, we say that it's really likely to establish an infection in a host. Uh, so maybe it's instructions to make some kind of toxin. Maybe it's instructions for an enzyme that helps it not be phagocytized as easily. Um, could be a lot of different things there. Okay. Uh, so that that's chapter 10 is, is kind of short. It's just kind of an intro to before we get into some processes here uh, of genetics. Okay, so chapter 11 is kind of long. Uh, we're going to think about how DNA, first of all, yeah, you got a question? Good question. Uh, are plasmids the only thing that can be transmitted? Um, I believe yes. I don't believe it exchanges chromosomes, but I would have to double check that to give you a sound answer. Uh, yes, so good question. Uh, okay, so we're gonna move into um, first, how DNA is replicated. Um, kind of an overview and then get really into the nitty gritty, all the enzymes that are involved or the, the basic enzymes that are involved. Everything's more complicated than what we'll talk about. Uh, but we'll go through those processes of replication, transcription, uh, protein synthesis, translation. So it's, it's really important as we, move, as we move forward to kind of keep those processes separate from each other in your mind. Um, might just, you know, a lot of recall and review to do that, uh, depending on your background, really. Um, we'll have to talk about um, how organisms keep from making proteins that they don't really need. That's regulation, operons, um, what can go wrong, some different kinds of mutations, what a cell can do about it, kind of briefly, and then a, a few other ways that cells can share DNA. We already talked about one a little bit, transformation and another conjugation. All right, so overview, flow of information. We call this the central dogma of genetics. Um, of course, the, the, the sequence of bases that are in the DNA, we refer to that as an organism's genotype. Um, and of course, DNA can be copied, and we call that replication, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen before it can make an RNA copy. Okay, a cell is going to copy its DNA when it's splitting, when it's splitting by binary fission into uh, two daughter cells. That's when it copies its DNA. It can be making RNA like all the time from that same DNA genotype. All right, so when RNA is made, we call that transcription. Um, whether it's making ribosomal RNA or tRNA, that's all transcription. But if we're following the flow of information uh, that's transcribed into R messenger RNA, each three of these is referred to as a codon. So that will be important later. Um, and then at the ribosome, that messenger RNA gets translated, changed into a new language of a, a sequence of amino acids that make up a protein. Okay, so the, the proteins that an organism can make will determine its phenotype. Okay, those, we, we think about those as observable traits. 
So when you think about different phenotypes for humans, it might be their eye color or, you know, whatever. Uh, for bacteria, we're looking for other traits, things like what sugars can they metabolize or what enzymes can they make? I mean, those are the kind of traits that we will be looking for. Uh, but it's actually not this simple because we know that if cells are in different environments, they can actually have a different phenotype. So just kind of keep that in mind uh, for certain traits, it depends on the environment. Um, I was trying to look up examples of that. Uh, and, you know, and I didn't come up with really any to share with you for bacteria, but, um, you know, height in humans, for example, uh, you know, it depends if you've had adequate nutrition as to whether you might get to your full height. Okay. Um, in Siamese cats, um, there's the te temperature uh, will influence whether one enzyme is made. If you picture a Siamese cat, their, their ears and their nose and their feet and their tail are a little darker. The fur is darker. And that's because of this temperature dependent, you know, enzyme, whether it's on or not, determines fur color. So um, environment can play a role. That's the only point that I wanted to make there. Okay, I think maybe I can go through this experiment in five minutes. Um, this has been called, when we think about how DNA is copied, um, Watson and Crick didn't really have anything to say about that. They suspected that it might by, be by one of these three methods, but they didn't do any testing there. Um, in 1958, there was uh, an experiment done by Messelson and Stahl. Uh, and, oops, that's an H. Uh, and this experiment has been called the most beautiful experiment in biology. Um, beautiful because not only did it prove, there was three hypotheses as to how DNA was replicated. Uh, and not only did it prove that one of those hypotheses was correct, but it disproved the other two. So it was very quickly accepted and there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, arguing about it. Uh, so the three methods were the conservative method, the semi-conservative method, and the dispersive method. Okay, so if you look at each of those with the conservative method, um, that said that the new the, the, that the, the new DNA was totally different than the parent DNA. So basically the parent DNA was conserved and, and the new DNA was made from both of those strands. So if you look at the first replication, uh, you know, you would have old and new. And then the second replication, you would have less of that conserved and, and more of the new. Uh, with the semi-conservative, that means, you know, one strand of that original DNA was conserved, okay, here and here. Uh, and with this dispersive method, that meant basically the DNA was maybe chopped up and you've got pieces of new mixed in with pieces of the old in that first generation. So the experiment that they did, they, and, and by the way, I have a YouTube link that maybe explains it a little bit more eloquently than what I am. So it's just a couple minutes long, um, but they used, uh, they grew their cells in a medium that had heavy nitrogen. So this wasn't radioactive nitrogen, but it was nitrogen that had an extra neutron. So uh, yeah, so it was heavier. Um, and when they, they spun down cells uh, in a centrifuge, uh, when they extracted the DNA uh, and spun it down, they got a band at, it was, went down pretty far in the tube because it was heavy nitrogen. Okay, so no matter which method was right, conservative, semi-conservative, or dispersive, when they grew cells, they had that heavy band. Um, after one generation, uh, they stopped growth, harvested the cells, extracted the DNA. So they'd have to know the generation time of whatever they use, E. coli or whatever. Uh, and they spun it down. If the conservative method was true, you would have two different bands. You would have old and new. But that's not what they found. They had this hybrid band. 
So they knew right away after one generation that it couldn't be replicated by that conservative method. But both by semi-conservative and dispersive would both give hy hybrid bands. So they had to go one more generation. They had to go to a, a, a second generation uh, and um, harvest the cells after a second generation. And what they found was that same hybrid band. And they also had a lighter band because again, now they're growing it in like normal light nitrogen. Um, and if it was, if this dispersive was true, then they would still just have hybrid bands. And that's not what they found. They found two different bands here. Uh, so again, two new, this, those would be the lighter bands and then these would be the hybrid bands. Okay, so um, it was just a very eloquent, and again, it proved that, that DNA is replicated semi-conservatively. So we'll get into replication next time. Uh, have a good day.